Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to inform that we will be starting at two past five. Thank you. Recording in progress. Okay, so as far as I go, I'm not going to be able to do this. Entitled Comprehending Aceh and Papua, Silencing Identity, Marginalization, and Agency, presented by the Department of Sociology, Brawijaya University. First of all, let us pray and praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his blessed and mercy, we are able to attend and participate in this event without any obstacles. In this moment, I also would like to welcome our guests and speakers for today, the Honorable Dr. Rare Paul M. Faisal Amin bin SSMSI as the PTD. attendees. Before we come to the main session, let me deliver the structure of the event today as follows. One, opening event. Two, the opening remarks from Mr. Dr. Rarepol M. Faisal Aminuddin as the PT Dean one of the Faculty of Social and Political Science, Bawijaya University. Three, the main session, which will be led by the moderator. Four, the question and answer session led by the moderator. And the last is closing. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next agenda, we would like to invite Mr. Dr. Rarepol M. Faisal Aminuddin SSMSI to give an opening speech. So to Mr. Faisal, uh, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Nuru uh, Sifa, yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, greetings of peace and health to all of us. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate to the Department of Sociology uh, for organizing this event called Stadium General uh, with the title Comprehending Aceh and Papua, <clears throat> Silencing Identity, Marginalization and Agency. And uh, the secondly, I'm very grateful to the speakers, uh, Dr. Jati Perkasa from CSIS Jakarta, uh, who will deliver material on unraveling Papua passionist memories. And uh, to Dr. Anna Maria Samuels from Leiden University, who will present uh, the theme HIV care, silence, and agency in Aceh. And to my colleagues, Dr. Erza Kilian, our faculty member who guided this activity as a moderator. Uh, as we know, Aceh and Papua are two regions uh, in Indonesia uh, that have received status as special autonomous regions uh, resulting from prolonged conflict before. And based on the Papua roadmap books published by Indonesian Institute of Science uh, in 2009, uh, Lippi, uh, elaborate on the roots of Papua conflict, 
such as marginalization, discrimination, including the lack uh, of recognition of Papua's contribution and service to Indonesia, uh, the lack of social infrastructure development, especially on education, health, economic uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, low level access to participation, uh, unfinished process in political economy, sociocultural integration, and widespread political violence uh, from security operation there uh, currently. Uh, meanwhile, in Aceh, starting from 2008 uh, until 2021, almost 90 trillion rupiah has been received from central government in Jakarta, uh, which is more than uh, funds for uh, if comparing with another province. Uh, but uh, not much progress can be uh, noted. Uh, and further exploration is needed uh, whether because there is no development blueprint for the use of these funds, uh, the program runs by various level of local government. There are not continuous and result or, uh, oriented. Uh, yeah, theoretically, just um, yeah, business as usual uh, to uh, spending uh, funds. And uh, are common problems with other local government management in uh, another province in Indonesia. And this causes socioeconomic disparities, uh, lack of health services, and other problems to uh, and still surveys right now. And I hope that this event can provide enlightenment regarding various problems above, how to look at the two provinces and what solutions are needed in the future. And finally, uh, on behalf of the Dean of Faculty of Social and Political Science, Universitas Prawijaya. I officially open this event. Thank you very much and have a fruitful discussion. Okay, thank you very much to Mr. Faisal Aminuddin for the speech and opening remark. Now we come into the main session that is webinar of Studium Generale entitled Comprehending Aceh and Papua, Silencing Identity, Marginalization and Agency. The session will be led by the amazing Mr. Mrs. Erza Kilian, PhD, as our moderator for today's discussion. Erza Kilian is a senior lecturer at the International Relations Study Program at Brawijaya University, Indonesia. She completed her bachelor's degree in international relations at Pajajaran University, Indonesia, her master's degree at the School of Business, Economics and Law at the University of Queensland, Australia, and her doctoral degree at the School of Politics and International Studies at University of Leeds, United Kingdom. Her research focuses mainly on political economic issues, both within the global and local context, particularly on trade, finance, investment, and global businesses. She has been involved in several research projects in Papua, Maluku, and East Java, observing the socio-political and economic dynamics between the government market actors and community. Having been raised, educated, and worked in West Papua, she has personally experienced this complex relationship for more than 20 years and has written several popular and research articles regarding Papua in several media outlets. Therefore, without further ado, I would like to give the space for her. To Mrs. Erza Kilian, the time is yours, please. Thank you very much um, for the lovely introduction. Um, so first of all, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Erza Kilian. Um, you can call me Erza, and I will be acting as your uh, moderator for today. Um, firstly, I feel very honored and grateful for this um, event, because I think this is a very timely event, um, considering that there has been an increase uh, both in conflict and social tensions, not just globally, but also locally. Um, at the global level, we see the war uh, the ongoing war happening between Russia and Ukraine, but also at the local level, there has been some social tensions, uh, the more recent one probably within the um, water resistance movement in Indonesia. Um, however, what tends to be overlooked within this um, social tensions and conflict is that there's always victims within these um, situations. There are always the marginalized community, there are always the oppressed voices, and sometimes we don't get, an, uh, we don't get to hear enough from them. So I think this is a very good um, discussion in the sense that um, we're putting the uh, marginalized community and their agency as the core of our discussions. 
And hopefully by the end of uh, today's Stadium General, we won't be just talking within the academic sense of the issues, but we can actually come up with some kind of solutions on how we can actually improve and, um, uh, and actually include these people within the larger context and then help them within the systemic oppression that probably some of them are facing. So um, joining us today um, are two excellent speakers. Um, one I think is joining us from Jakarta and the other one is joining us from the Netherlands. So I think it's uh, quite a fickle here, um, but it's good that we actually can manage to do the time. Um, so um, one will be covering um, the easternmost part of Indonesia, talking about the issues in Papua, and then the other one would be covering the westernmost part of Indonesia, which is Aceh province. Um, I think in terms of its uh, geographical coverage, it's really good, but it's not just about ge geographical coverage. These two regions um, is also, I would say, one of the most dynamic and the most vibrant regions of Indonesia, particularly in terms of its um, social security and political dynamic. So I think we will have a very fruitful and insightful discussions today. Um, so before we start into our discussions, um, allow me to introduce or shortly introduce uh, to our, to our two of our esteemed speakers. So um, our first speaker is Dr. Vidyandika Jati Perkasa. Uh, Dr. Perkasa is a senior researcher, former head of the Department of Politics and Social Change at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta, Indonesia. He is also the former chief editor of Analysis Journal, uh, published by the CSIS. And Dr. Perkasa received his Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology uh, at, the at the Faculty of Letters, Universitas Gajah Mada in 1992. And in 1995, he obtained his master's degree from the Department of Social Policy and Planning in Developing Countries at the London School of Economics and Political Science uh, in United Kingdom. In 2005, he obtained his PhD at the Department of Anthropology, School of Political and Social Inquiry at the Faculty of Arts, Monash University in Australia. For the past 16 years, um, Dr. Perkasa has been conducting intensive research in the areas of governance, conflict, and social accountability. His main research area is in Papua, and he has worked intensively with elements of civil society and government to promote better governance in the province. One of his research deals with effort to empower civil society groups to promote social accountability in Papua. And Dr. Perkasa has also published extensively and attended various seminars and workshops regarding Papua, um, particularly regarding the issues of governance, conflict, community participation, internationalization of Papua, and racism. That's quite an extensive um, CV, actually. Um, and our second speaker um, joining us from uh, the Netherlands is Dr. Anne-Marie Samuels. Um, Dr. Samuels is an associate professor of cultural anthropology and development sociology at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on end-of-life care, uh, HIV AIDS, narrative, morality, and disaster in Indonesia. She is the author of After the Tsunami, Disaster Narratives, and the Remaking of Everyday Life in Aceh, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 2019. Uh, and she is currently leading the European Research Council funded project, Globalizing Palliative Care, a multi-sided ethnographic study of practices, policies, and discourses of care at the end of life. So looking at these um, two CVs, um, we can both, I, I think we can all um, agree that uh, they're both experts in the field and then we'll be having a very productive discussion, I guess. Um, so for the schedule, um, each speaker will have around uh, 30 minutes uh, to do the presentation, uh, followed by around 60 minutes question and answer sessions. So um, I think without further ado, Mr. Uh, apologies, uh, Dr. Prakasa will be presenting his uh, work on unraveling Papua's memoria passionist, dreadful implications, enhancing politics of recognition or simplifying the complexity. So Dr. Perkasa, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Erza, for the lovely introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and friends. Uh, Buersa, I'm actually sitting quite nicely in your campus in Brawijaya. <laughs> 
in, Apologies. <laughs> in gedung A in the seventh floor. So it's lovely to be here. And um, first of all, I would like to express my personal and sincere gratitude, uh, especially to Pali Maksum, uh, the head of the sociology department at Prabhuja University. And also thank you for the nice introduction from uh, Faisal Aminuddin uh, earlier. Before I start my presentation, let me give a, a little brief uh, overview of, of, of this stadium generally, which uh, has also been uh, reiterated by, by uh, Pak Faisal and also Bu Ersa. I think if, if we choose Aceh and Papua, it's by no means a coincidence. I think it's, it's, it's really rare to have a discussion which combine those two localities. Yeah. But I think our main uh, intention and motivation why we need to talk about Aceh and Papua, of course, the whole idea and discourse of um, national integration. I think we have experienced um, dreadful memories of disintegration with uh, the, the with East Timor and also other other issues of uh, resurgence. For example, in Maluku, and also we have Aceh and Papua. I think this, this discussion is by no means a way to compare Aceh and Papua. They're quite different. But also, there are also similarities, right? What pa Faisal has and then Buersa have also stated. I mean, like both as a resource rich countries, uh, a province, I so sorry, and uh, both have experienced separatist movement and both have experienced intensive military action both with the special autonomy right now, but the difference is also there. Aceh, problem solved with international mediation. Papua, no. So if, if, if we go to Papua, if we talk to people of Papua, they, they kind of feel a sense of envy in this case, right? I mean, in terms of why can't we solve Papua like in Aceh? That's a big question which I think nobody could answer. Why can't we bring the international actors to solve Papua, like what it happened in Aceh. That's the differences. Another difference is, of course, relate to the action itself. Aceh, we can consider their action through the, the GAM, the Gerana Chamedga, as a more solid action in contrast with what happened in Papua. We have the OPM, right, which is considered more fragmented in the sense. But I think it's good to have both Aceh and Papua in the same table because we want to understand lesson learned. We want to understand best practices. We want to understand challenges. But I think Aceh, maybe Anna will, will, will talk more on that. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not a um, conflict-free area at the moment. Of course, we're, we're always will be in a fear of not having Aceh into facing setback in conflict area. So, so it's, it's, it's basically a comparative um, assessment of a post-conflict area still with the problem and also a conflict area. So it's a good, it's a good combination. And let me now uh, allow me to share screen with my presentation. Okay, so um, I try to be thought provoking by making this title. And I want all of you, I know most of you are, are students here. I want all of you to be critical on the presentation that I'm going to make, right? And I, I, I fully agree on what Buersa just mentioned. We're not just talking about academic things. We want solution. I think that's the, 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 the most important thing. We need to have solution. Now, even though I will be talking about the old issues of Papua, but I'm, I'm also gonna provide all of you with the updates, right? the challenges. And is the government doing the right things in handling Papua? So that's all the thing that um, you need to be critical on it, right? Now, the term of my, 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 my presentation, it's, I'm using a, a word which is actually not that familiar in terms of um, academic discourse. But if, 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 if you look on various literature on Papua, you might find a few of the discussion using the terms memoria passionis. 
What does that mean? Memoria passionis is a collective memory of suffering and violence, right? So it's actually a, dis, uh, a divisive tool, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a divisive tool because it, it finally causes this agreement that separate people into opposing groups. And that's the fact. There's now a dichotomy between the us and them. We are Papuan and you are Indonesian. The us and them, Papua and Indonesia. And why is this important? Because I see it from my personal view is we haven't succeeded to resolve this memoria passionis. It's very dynamic in its nature. It determines Papua needs, but it also needs argumentation and solution. How can we solve this memoria passionis? So there are a few things. There's a lot in my, in my plate to discuss eh? because of the complexity of Papua. Please bear in mind with me on that. So what I'm going to discuss in this sense is, first of all, what is actually the implication of Papua Memorial's passion is towards the security, st stability, and development in Papua, number one. Number two, what is actually the international dimension which resulted from Papua Memorial passion is? Number three, we talk about international dimension. Of course, we will talk about the impact of domestic. And I, I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, Bu Irsa is moderating uh, this um, this session because she's she 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 she's with the international relation knowledge. So I would it's it's quite quite relevant uh, uh, in how we we see this international dimension uh, seeing from the IR perspective. Okay, after the domestic impact of the memory passion is how is identity the millennials an agency constructed in the Papuan case identity has become a, 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 a the 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 subtitle of this of this uh, stadium generally, so it's a very important element. What is the solution after we talk about all of this impact? Are the solution being offered by the government, especially, proof to solve the complexity of the Papua? Is it effective, or is it just, it's only a portrait of simplification? So I want you to all be critical on on those issues with me. Let me start with forces number one of memory of passionists. I know you are all aware, right, that there is a host historical problem. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of uh, historical um, books or literature which discuss what really happened in the 1969 when Papua was quote unquote integrated into the nation state of Indonesia. But integration itself is not a word that has been agreed by everybody. For the Papuans, for the majority of Papuans, it's not an integration, it's an annexation. This historical um, clarification and validation tends to be missing in the discourse of Papua. But if you go to Papua, if you talk to the millennials, if you talk to the people there, it's always there. They want to understand ato meninjo kembali, reinvestigate what really happened in the 1969 when Papua was first quote unquote integrated into the nation state of Indonesia. Because of the lack of literature or because of the diversity of literature, which in some way contested one to the others, it causes confusion and it causes disagreement among many, many people. There's no time for me to explain the history of that, but I just want to say that the historical facts which emerge or which is socialized at the moment constitute a historiography of the powerful. I quote Ingo Rasoriawan, an uh, uh, academician in Papua on, in such sense. So actually what we need is a counterbalance, a more diverse historical facts from below. That's why I, I want to restate the importance of Black Buddha Ersa was mentioned, understanding the marginalized voices of the Papuan and how they understand history and how they face 
historical. I don't mind at all to have a constated historical discourse in, of Papua in the 1969. I think that's important. But we always have to avoid to have the domination of historical fact because of the powerful. So in, in, in such case, what I propose in, 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 in this case is, is to have a more historical investigation. But from the government point of view, this is kind of thing is not important. Maybe they, they, they presume that the, the demand of the review or the investigation of the historical of Papua will fade away some way, but it, it would never will. It will sustain until unknown time. So this is Memora Pashot number one. And I think this is the first simplification which the government have done of not taking this, this uh, historical validation seriously. Because all what the Papuan understand is what happened in the act of free choice in 1969 was it, it was full of manipulation, intimidation, and of full of terror. And it's those kind of information has been transmitted from generation to generation through storytelling. Number two, most feasible is of course the economic dimension. Papua is not at all about money. It's not at all about money. Let me just quote uh, the figures of, uh, of how, many, how much money have been dispersed to the conference. From 2002 until 2021, 138.6 trillion have been dispersed to Papua. That's not yet including other kinds of funds, for example, the uh, transfer to the funds of the TKDD, which is 702 million, uh, and also uh, uh, other funds. Totaling, it's about nearly a thousand trillion have been have been distributed to Papua from 2002 to 2001. What has the impact been? A slight improvement of human development index, but still Papua is the lowest country with the human development index in Indonesia. It's not only development which is concerned, but it's also public services and education. Only 4% of the, the funds have been allocated in the, uh, uh, for education, well, the regulation of the autonomy kusus mentioned that it, it should be 30%. And we have also problems of massive corruption. And I'm quite surprised why there are such a minimum cases of corruption prosecution occurring in Papua, contrary to, uh, to the other uh, areas in Indonesia. We also have problems of bad governance. I'm saying bad governance. We're not having only weak governance, but, but also bad governance. And we also have natural resource exploitation. Normally we used to understand uh, free port, but now there are more and more investment occurring in Papua, whether that be in the palm oil, palm oil investment or the block wabu, what block wabu is also similar to free port. And there's been cases of land grabbing, the ulayat of the people, or the, 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 the land of the people has been bought very cheaply. So there are complexities in terms of economic aspect, which has caused the marginalization and, 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 and resource exploitation in the province. If we talk about development, right? Because the autonomy kusus is of course development heavy, Development from for who is actually being targeted in Papua? Because there are skepticism among the Papuan that that's not development for us. That's development for the migrant people. And uh, President Joko, Joko, Widodo, Joko Widodo have been heavily uh, invested in infrastructure development, but still it's seen uh, as very skeptics by, by most of the Papuan. So I think in such case, there is always a way to uniform Papuan 
like the Indonesian, like the, like the rest of the other areas in Indonesia. There is no way to kind of understand Papua with their own local and cultural context. For example, why do we have to force Papua to eat rice when they do not eat rice? They eat the sagu. So there's uniformity in that case. Why can't we build a school curriculum which is contextualized toward the local needs, either than making generalization of the national curriculum? And we see there's no doctor, there is no teacher there, because they're afraid of the security aspect, or there's no such a good incentive for that. So I think in the academic discourse, there's just too many representation of Papua make by the outsiders. So, so people tend to recognize Papua from their own needs, but the Papua does not have the rights to, to express their own, their own needs. So I think this is, uh, in the academic discourse, maybe you all have read about the article written by Gayatis Pifak. Can the subaltern really speak? Now, I, I, I categorize the Papuan, the indigenous Papuan as the subaltern. Can they really speak for their needs? There's just too many representation on Papua, which actually detach the, the, the real needs of the Papuan for themselves. Another element of this memoria passionis is, of course, the fear of being extinct and alienated. I feel quite sad when I, I talk with the, the local Papuan and they always said and mention the word, kami takut punah. They are so afraid to be extinct. Because of what? Yeah, of course, there are many factors to, to that. One of it is, of course, their fear of the massive transmigration to Papua, which have started since the New Order regime. And of course, this, this kind of transmigration have caused economic, political, and social cultural marginalization. They just can't compete at this stage with the, the migrant community. Even though there, there are various, the so-called affirmative action to kind of um, enhance the position of the local Papuan, it still doesn't work. And with more migrant community, it also prepared with racism and discrimination. Now, the problem to understand this is because in Papua, there is such a minimum census or data which kind of uh, can describe this, this kind of issue. But uh, from various literature, which uh, I managed to gather, uh, in 1971, uh, the migrant community consists of 4% of the total population. But in 2000, it has consists of 35% of the, the total population. And in a few cities, for example, in Jayapura, Marowari, Sorong, and Bianufor, the Orang Asli Papua, the Nijit Papua, has become minority in their own land. Actually, there, there have been some effort, right, as, uh, also commanded by, by the MRP or the Majelis Radiat Papua to kind of uh, make a, a stop or a moratorium towards this transmigration. But of course, it's, that kind of thing is impossible to, to, to be implemented. So there are various narratives which have been occurring in, 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 in describing the depopulation of the Papuan people. If, if you all read uh, various literature, uh, especially written by the foreign, foreign scholars, people kind of say that it's genocide happening. I, I myself personally disagree of, by using this word uh, genocide, right? Or people might mention it, is it a slow motion genocide? So, but I think the whole idea of the population is of course related to, to the incapability of the, the, the local Papuan to get access towards uh, basic social services. For example, one data is mentioned that uh, the infant mortality rate experienced by OAP is 18.4%, while the non-OAP is 3.6%. Such a, la a large uh, gap in terms of that. But I think because they do not have access towards health facilities or they live in isolated um, community, so uh, the fear of 
Kepunahan is of course one major aspect which uh, causes the memory of passionists in the Papua context. Now, this is the, the other uh, forces of memory of passionists is of course violence. Now in this case, I want you to all be fair in how we picturize or we portrait violence in Papua. Many years ago, yeah, it's quite, qu quite clear that the violence uh, it's implicates uh, the, the security apparatus, whether that be the NE or the police with the OPM. But now there's just a proliferation of actors in Papua, which cause violence, right? Mentioning a view, uh, there is also um, a horizontal conflict uh, among the Papuan themselves because of the Perang Adat. And there's also sometimes a, a friction between the Papuan mountain and the Papuan coastal. And they just don't have the same view on how to see Papua in the future. They see the coastal Papuan as betraying uh, the idea of independence. Uh, and, uh, but they also see the Pantos, Mantonis Papuan as, uh, 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 as brutal in terms of their, their struggle. And there's also the element of society which is pro-independence and for NKRE, pro-independence could be also local Papuans, uh, which, which, which is sided with the, with the, with the Indonesian. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the pro-NKRE the pro could be also Papuan. And there's also the Barisan Mela Putih, Barisan Rat Pembela NKRE, uh, which also it's uh, pro to the NKRE. Um, and, and some li uh, foreign literature also mentioned that, that there are the militias. Uh, please be critical on that. Uh, because uh, before having a, a strong proof of that. Above all, I mean, um, there's just no um, justice in terms of violence. It's a brutal attack. There's impunity from both sides. And just recently, the, 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 the Pangdam Jaya uh, stated that we are now doing a soft approach and a humanistic approach in Papua, but it's still unclear what do they mean by soft approach or humanistic approach. So for the OPM, last time we might see them as a part of the, 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 the a movement which defend the rights of the Papua who face injustice, but I don't think that's the case for right now. They have their own motivation and they are also fragmented by themselves. So they are not... Uh, they could not be seen as a guardian of, uh, uh, to represent the whole Papua in terms of such oppression. And also there are an increased violence recently uh, that has shown that uh, more violence is occurring. Uh, I, I will come back to that later on. And there's also a new development of labeling the KKB or the OPM as terrorism. What is the impact of that? Of course, more troops will be sent to Papua. There, uh, and there will be a preemptive arrest. I mean, people who are who are affiliated or, or, or suspect to be affiliated with the, the KKB will be easily arrested. And of course, there will be a, the risk of arresting a nonviolence protester. And of course, it will, with more military personnel, it will create even intense trauma towards society. And of course, uh, there's also a risk of a wrongdoing arrest. So the implication of labeling KKB as terrorism is, of course, it's, 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 it's complicating the situation. So I, in, in such case, I do not see it, but, but there is a conflict management and security um, a system that is currently uh, applied in the, in the Papuan context. So that's, that's a really a worrying uh, situation. And of course, there's also a memory of passionness is also related to the issue of racism and discrimination. I think we all know that, that uh, uh, there are, um, the Papuan usually um, understand or perceive that racism is a is a state-induced effort. It's a state-induced effort to stigmatize them and promote racial differences, which cause difference in treatment. We learn from the uh, Surabaya tragedy, and I've talked to the some of the millennials while while I was in Yogyakarta that uh, they find difficult to find boarding house for student. They're stigmatized to be alcoholic, troublemaker, criminals, and some are bullied, uh, kobong, which means they're dark skin. So from their perspective, 
the, reprodu the reproduction of a culture of differences in, through the discrimination of racism is a strong, have a strong economic and political motivation of racism. So it is intense, uh, it, it, is, it is intended to create a sense of inferiority, no confidence. So in the, in the perspective of the millennials, so they will not rebel when outside forces are exploiting natural resources and afraid to take opportunity exclusive. So actually it's a, it's a mentality uh, breakdown from this racism which, 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 uh, which oppressed the, the, the most of the students especially. And of course, uh, there are also problems of, of distrust. I think extreme distrust to all level of authority and governance. They do not believe the central government. They do not believe their own government, provincial or local level. So uh, they don't even believe any, anybody. So there's, there's extreme distrust to all level of authority and governance. And people say that what's happening is selling Bakutipu. They all cheat to each other. Bakutipu is a, is a common word uh, from uh, Papuan. Now, let me go uh, quickly into the security dimension of the, so this figure actually clearly shows, right? Uh, just please uh, pay attention on the writing inside of the, the curve. So actually we haven't done a lot in terms of how to, re to, to solve this conflict. Rising tension, confrontation, sometimes there's intermittent violence, but sometimes the conflict escalate where we have never been in the stage of agreement. We have never been in the stage of agreement implementation. We have never been in the stage of decreasing tension. So this is really an alarming and problematic issues in how conflict is actually managed in the, in the Papuan case. And I want to present also, I am indebted to my, my colleague, uh, Alif Sadria at CSIS, who have done a calculation on, on violence and fatalities. And this is actually a quite a new, an, uh, a new data. And uh, it shows that there, there are increasing conflict. Now we talk about uh, conflict in Papua, there, 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 are, there are various and diverse conflict, of, uh, conflict in Papua. So it's, it's, it's an arm, arm conflict. Uh, it is also horizontal conflict, uh, added conflict, prang suku and so forth. But the, the, the numbers is actually very staggering. So in 2015, we only have 91 and, and, it, and, and it significantly increased. Well, in 2021, there are 39, 319 cases of uh, violence and, and con incidents in, 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 in Papua. In terms of fatalities, it's also staggering, even though uh, the, the number tends to be fluctuative from 2015, but something did happen in 2019 when there is 183 uh, fatalities related to conflict, even though it, it's, it's decreasing. Conflict related to, to, to uh, the OPM is also uh, increasing, uh, uh, only 11 cases uh, in 2015, but it tends to, it's, it's significantly increased in 2021, where we have 139 cases of armed conflict which implicate the OPM. So we can see that the labeling of uh, KKB as tourism did not have a linear effect towards decreasing conflict in the Papuan case. In terms of fatalities, it's also a, a staggering number and it, it, it tends to increase from 16 to, to 59 on on, on, on in, in 2021. So the internal this dimension, I'm, going to, I'm just gonna go very quickly on this matter. And I think um, it's quite surprising when I talk to one diplomat uh, from the Kementerian Luar Negeri that he mentioned that there is no such thing of Papua internationalization. It is all under control, but actually it's quite it's quite clear what is actually the, the embryo of Papua, the international of Papua. And I'm in a position to say that whatever movement is made by the international actors, it's not a, a sincere movement. It's, it's, it's clearly highly motivated uh, with self-collective and foreign interests. So interestingly, the only elements of the Papua, uh, the memoir passionis, which is, has been always been 
brought up through the internationalization of Papai always relate to issues of human rights violation and racism. There's no other issues on that. For example, the economic issues or the, 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 the issues of uh, history of integration and so forth. So it's, it's really, a, it's really a, a lethal combination. If both racism and discrimination, it's combined with the human rights aspect of that. So once somebody asks me, so how to solve the international of Papua? This is actually it's an easy answer. You solve the embryo, you solve of the memoir passionist dimension. But are we doing it? I don't think so. It's very, it's very ironic. It's very ironic. It's really an easy answer, but we're not doing anything about it. So what, what is actually happening there? There are just so many elements of actors, even though proliferated and fragmented, but there's just many on, 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 that, on that aspect. I'm not gonna read one by one, but it's spread all over the world, even though in Africa, in America, in Australia, in the Pacific Islands, uh, in the UK, um, probably there's one in, 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 in Dutch and, and so forth and so forth. So there are proliferated actors which, which, which deem for the, in, uh, for the internationalization of Papua in such case. And if you see, uh, I took I took this source from the from the uh, literature uh, titled "We Need to Talk About Papua in 2020." There have been various events uh, which basically support uh, West Papua in terms of in terms of um, either referendum or independence. If you can see that uh, there are uh, events in in Washington, in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, and the Solomon Island in Fiji. And, and many more, any more. So you can see how, how the international uh, elements if, is trying to, or have been trying to delve into the issue of F Papua so far, right? And, and um, now um, this is also the one I took from uh, the, the, the book, but I think we have to be quite cautious in, in trying to, to validate the information. Of course, uh, Benny Wenda is, is surely uh, one uh, figure which has been widely talked about and also uh, semi sambum but there's also various uh, actors in various countries which which uh, are or has been accused to to have uh, a connection with the, the issue of 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 papua in, in in this case so what is the modus operandi of of, of the international uh, association of papua of course they always try to use the UN mechanism to voice their aspiration. And we have, we have find various kinds of uh, event, for example, the United Nations General Assembly 2024 and 2019 UN session, which actually urged for the UN to send their mission as fact-finding mission to Papua to investigate uh, human rights violation, right? Even though it, 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 it didn't, it doesn't succeed uh, uh, until now. And also through individual effort, for example, the Ferona Kokoman or Benny Wenda, or even by organization to ULMWP or the MMCG. And also they are not very progressively involved in the role by using technology and social media. And finally, through violence. Usually the Takabe always use the momentum, right? To create violence if there are the UN event, so it's 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 a way by them to attract attention uh, towards uh, the issue of uh, uh, in in Papua. So, what is what are the counter strategies being adopted until now? Uh, from what I've studied upon, I mean, well, it's always this whole idea of diplomacy in the UN. I mean, it's maybe you all have known that there are several occasions when Indonesia have sent their young diplomats to counter attack uh, um, accusation towards what's happening in, in Papua. And they're, they're, they're also uh, effort by strengthening economic and social cultural cooperation, especially in the Pacific countries, uh, because the Pacific countries, one uh, countries, uh, which is uh, uh, usually so progressive in terms of um, uh, supporting Papua 
towards uh, referendum or or independence. So there has there been fine various kinds of uh, collaboration uh, there. But also the government tends to also uh, try to use the social media to 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 block them or by the internet shout down. Uh, but as uh, some that did work and some didn't work. So uh, uh, some some of the social media have been closed down, but I, I still can can open some of them. So the big question here is maybe uh, Bu Ersa is more knowledgeable on, 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 on such case. Until when can we rely on the UN integral statement of Papua as part of Indonesia or country sovereignty re being respected? Can we all still rely on this statement that okay because UN is supporting is supportive of Indonesian sovereignty then that's it that's enough for us but I don't think we can compromise if there are more injustice there are more human rights violation occurring in Papua and the the international community or to UN will will only just sit down so I think it's this kind of thing we should all be cautious on such case because there, there, is, there is no steady uh, um, position that the, the UN will take in terms of the dynamics which is uh, occurring in, in, in Papua. Now, the next memoir passion it is, of course, about identity, right? I did the shrinking, the identity silencing as the, the title of this, of, this, uh, of this lecture. And um, The Papuan, as I mentioned before, are in fear of being extinct. They are in fear of being puna in, in, in terms of their, their, their identity. And so far, they, have, they find no safe heaven when, where they could express their grievances and their identity. So I... I categorize or I visualize this condition as the public space for the Papuan to express themselves is now shrinking because whenever they express themselves, they are always terrorized, they are always uh, captured, arrested, and uh, brutalized by, by, by security officer. So they now run to express their identity online. So through social media, Papuan are strengthening their identity by raising distinctive ethnic constitution. Once we know Papuan as the powerless, right? Because of discrimination and racism, they are an entity which doesn't have power. But now it's a new form of power struggle which they find through the use of technology. So it's a different form of struggle from the OPM guerrilla, which formed their resistance through armed resistance. Technology has been used by the, the, the pub one to kind of develop the discourse, develop, uh, deliver awareness to current situation that pub one should be wary of thought and action. And of course, many media platforms have, have uh, facilitated uh, their, their intention of this identity construction. Uh, for example, Facebook, right, uh, has been used to see uh, as a uh, virtual place to discover who we are to be Papuan. And also they are more proud to, to show their physical appearance. Once, maybe many years ago, Papuan are ashamed to be dark, to be curly and, and so forth and so forth. But now it's, it's a different situation. They want to show the distinctiveness that we are Papuan and we are different with the Indonesian. So it's, 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 it's also a way of challenging domination and oppression by connecting each other and sharing outreach and feeling together, togetherness via the means of technology. So through the, the online platform, they feel the freedom. Uh, they contested the Indonesian because they, they, they are just so overwhelmed of, of them trying to be Indonesian process Indonesisasi. They don't want to stay in such position and want to form their own identity, which is distinct from that, right? So there are, there are now counter narrative of the, the uh, which they call Papuanas, or they see themselves of the black of Indonesian, 
So it's, it's uh, a new form of struggle by using technology. And just briefly, I just want to share that there are many um, platforms of, uh, that has been used to express this identity construction awareness and struggle, for example, in Facebook, there's the free campaign movement in Twitter also, there's also in YouTube, uh, there's also various website which, uh, which, which um, uh, shows uh, various forms of media coverage towards uh, the life of the Papa and also the TV broadcasting. Sadly, all of the title that has been broadcast in the TV, it's, it's really an unpleasant title. It always shows uh, issues of uh, torturing, human rights violation. So actually, we're kind of lacking, right? lack of counter narrative, uh, which shows the other picture of Papua. I think we need more things to do that despite effort, of course, to uh, kind of uh, deal with the issue of human rights violation. We also need uh, counter narrative uh, to be broadcast in TV or even in the social media. Like what uh, I think one um, artist like uh, Arisia Sali and who was his wife, um, what, who, who tends to, shows video yeah. in Nia Zulkarnain. Yes, Nia Zulkarnain, thank you. Uh, that, that, that intensively broadcast or shows the other side of Papua. And it's, it's a very, a very um, uh, beautiful picture of that. I mean, it, it's, I think it's important for all of us to see Papua in, 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 in fire's dimension, not just from the, 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 the dreadful implication of human rights and, and so forth. And uh, let me briefly try to share a, a research that uh, has been conducted by CSI, my, my, my colleague there, that uh, Facebook has given us uh, data, various data. And one of it is um, the tools of CrowdTangle. CrowdTangle is a tool uh, from Facebook, which help, uh, help uh, us to follow, analyze, and report on what's happening across social media. Now, from our findings, from our, from our interaction, from our analysis, now follower, follower trends to increase in, in Facebook in terms of, of uh, 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 various uh, Facebook uh, website in terms of Papua. And the total interaction increase when there are local violence perpetrated by security apparatus. So top interaction every month always relate to violence. So it's always about violence which attracts people. Um, nothing than that and so so it's uh the most active uh links or website uh that voice the papuan grievance is the free west papuan campaign and i think there are no other uh website except the polda papua or the papua channel in sora papua which which can compete towards the aggressive um expression of papua grievances in through the through 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 website so it's just an example the, uh, which uh, we analyze from this through this crowd tangle. I uh, just want to take one of the website. It's the Free West Papua campaign. So in 13th of June, uh, there was unrest and violence occurring during the reading of the verdict of the unrest defendant. And what happened after that? The follower significantly increased of the Free West Papua campaign. And on the 10th of December, celebration of the Human Rights Day. And there's, there's also an increase of uh, followers in Free West Papua campaign. And if, if we see the, see, we can see the, the followers significantly increase, especially for the West Persman campaign, as comparison to the other um, uh, website, which have minimum followers, if, even though they all talk about Papua issue, but I think the Free uh, West Papua campaign uh, succeed in uh, attracting viewers uh, in terms of uh, their news and their coverage, right? Uh, and also, if, if we see the interaction and what is happening, the free West Papua campaign is very uh, progressive in terms of broadcasting various news to, to, of course, to find sympathy from, from various parties on what is happening in Papua. And only the Polda Papua and uh, I think the Suara Papua have the, 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 the capability to kind of counter narrative uh, what is happening, even though it's still it's a huge a gap on on such matters. So this is the same top interaction. It's and we also did uh, a research 
uh, uh, towards the the Papua millennials, right? So, so I think uh, we cannot see uh, the perception of the millennials Papua as one single entity. Of course, they are they they can be considered as a diverse element of the society, which also have a diverse opinion towards their existence as Papuan. So, but most of them argue that Papuan is not Indonesian because they have their own histori historical trajectory. I think that's, it make, it, it make quite sense, right? Because of their integration, which is only occurring in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, which where the other areas of Indonesia has is, is been dealing with the, the colonialism since, since uh, many years before. And also uh, what I mentioned before, there's also physical appearance, dust and curly hair as seen as a Papuan identity. And it, it creates their strong ethnic consciousness. Yeah. Now they are, this is what we call their agencies. They're not, they're not subverts towards discrimination and racism anymore, but they're proud to be Papuan. And they see that there's no such thing as dual nationalism. Many years ago, um, we still can identify that to be Papuan is to be, is to be with a dual nationalism. Right? One is the nationalism of Indonesia, and the other is the nationalism of the Papuan. But such dual nationalism do not exist exist in this current situation because they only recognize one nationalism, which is the Papuan nationalism. And also, like what I mentioned before, there's always a intergeneration transmission of uh, this identity element that many parents have taught uh, their children that. Indonesia, the, our Papua is, is, is not a part of Indonesia. And one day Papua will achieve its ind independence. So um, their perception is actually quite uh, skepticism, skeptics, right? That, that, that they just feel that they're not part of the Indonesian and they just see the Indonesian as just taking our national resources and the media framing, which disadvantaged them that uh, one, one Papuan student in Yogyakarta uh, have expressed their 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 sadness that uh, that one of uh, her lecture in Yogyakarta yeah. uh, mentioned that beauty is white and and not dark and curly and and so forth and she, she felt that she was humiliated in that class because of that that characterization and um, but on the other hand there's still some space of negotiation because some of the millennials also said that, okay, um, that I think we can negotiate our position of how we can, how can we be positioned towards the NKRI. But uh, so um, some say that they're not proud at all to be, to be Indonesian, but, but the other say that if, if there are changes in Papua, there are changes in Papua, we, we still have the eagerness to be with Indonesia. So, so there are pretty condition, right? That which, which the, the, the Papuan millennials has given uh, uh, in order for us to, to kind of uh, understand that, that even though there are still hardship in terms of life in the Papuan, but if things changes, then we, we still have um, a space to, to, to position ourselves uh, Papuan as part of the Indonesian uh, nation state. So there are diverse, diverse uh, argumentation on that. Now, lastly, my last slide connects to the domestic issues. Of course, right, uh, what I perceive as how we understand soft approach to Papua, humanistic approach Papua is pretty much related to special autonomy, whether that be special autonomy one or the extension of special autonomy two, which has just been stipulated a uh, few months ago. But let's learn, first of all, what is the intention of special autonomy? Of course, it's, a, it's, it's really a political, again, economic and security motivated because special autonomy was given, um, it's a bargaining tools that so if for, for from the central government, so that uh, the, the society or the community in Papua would not opt or, or would not demand for independence, even though obviously it does not work, right? So, so it's also a way to, in some way, enhance the politics of recognition and to counter marginalization. Now, what happened in Special Autonomy 1 uh, that has uh, gone through 2001, 2021, 
of course, actually from the from the articles itself, it, it's beautiful, beautifully written, right? Uh, like what <clears throat> um, I saw as explained before, it follows the leapy assessment of uh, what is happening in Papua. There's historical and political status. There is the marginalization and discrimination articles. There is the failure of development articles and also the violence and human rights violation articles. But sadly, all of these articles are not implemented. And another ironic view of this first special autonomy is it has a weak leg legitimacy because during the drafting of this autonomy, not everybody agreed and not, every, not everybody were involved in drafting the law. I think there's such a problem in terms of drafting, drafting such regulation because we never have the courage to kind of ask our opponent to sit together and talk about certain issues together. So actually the whole drafting of the special autonomy should also involve the opponent. This could be clearly the, the, the OPM, for example, but it never happened. So it, it's, it's fairly exclusive in terms of the drafting. And the special autonomy one is of course considered a failure because of the bad governance, what I mentioned before, the weak governance, the lack of technical regulation. And Menaslu Papuan says that Jakarta or the central government is not actually sincere to give the special autonomy. They, they, they usually said with the words, you, you, you let the head go, but you still hold our tail. So actually there's no freedom at all to implement, implement the articles within the special autonomy. And Papua remains the poorest region in the world, even though there have been attempts during the SPA administration to revise the law, but it never happened. And I think one of the critical element which uh, kind of uh, jeopardized the whole, the whole objective of the special autonomy is the deletion of the commission of, of truth and reconciliation. I think this KKR is, has a very significant role as trust building, as commitment to solve human rights uh, violation, but for some reason it has been deleted. And, and also the local political parties has not been established, so different from the Aceh case. And there's problem as well with the regional symbols during the Gustur Gust, 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 uh, era administration, we are allowed to, 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 um, to raise the morning flag uh, as long as the, it's not higher than the red and red, uh, the, the Miraputi flag, but now, it's banned totally. Uh, the the, the Pindakajora flag is not allowed to be to, to raise in, in, in any case. And there is also continuous violence of the indigenous Papuan economic and political rights. Now, what happened with the special autonomy part two? I think leg legitimacy is still a problem. There's also problem of rep representation. Uh, there's lack of public cons consultation. And there's also a problem in undermining the result of the MRP uh, public consultation because in Papua Barat, uh, uh, the MRP or, or the representation of the Papuan people uh, conducted a public consultation with the people. And the result was most of them rejected of the extension of Papua Special Autonomy, autonomy too. But I think the government did not uh, take this, uh, this finding into consideration. And still, they, they continue with the draft of the special autonomy too, which actually have divided the Papuan society into the, 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 the society which is pro towards the, the extension of special autonomy part two, and also the which is contra towards special autonomy part two. So um, there are two, um, the, the, the OTSUS part two, the revised 18 articles, but now uh, more money will be distributed again, uh, still uh, economic issues, but with tight supervision from the central government. And uh, the, the articles on political party has been firmly deleted now, but uh, they uh, instead changed that uh, the political aspect of the Papuan representation will be brought uh, or be, will be regularized through the mechanism of the Dewan Perwakilan Rakyat 
Kabupaten and Dewan Perwakilan Rakyat uh, Provinsi. So it's actually an affirmative action to put more uh, indigenous Papuan uh, in into the into the parliament. So so they they don't need to be to be appointed. Uh, sorry, they are they are appointed and not selected. So this political aspect it's it's conducted there. So there is also um, uh, articles which shows the economic activity should be prioritized towards the indigenous Papuan and also more funds towards empowering other community, the establishment of this agency to expedite uh, special autonomy. And of course, one controversial uh, article is of course on the expansion or the Pemekaran policy. But um, ironically, in this article, it's giving more role for the central government and the DPR to initiate the Pemekaran with or without the consultation of the MRP and, and DPRP. So I think I think it's it's really problematic because until now we haven't seen a, a, a success case of pemekaran occurring in in Papua. Okay, so um, just uh, give me a uh, two or three minutes to to wrap up. So actually, what's happening now? It's still business as usual. And it's business as usual. So uh, the the policy itself is top down. It did not involve the opponent and minimum deliberation process. And also the 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 new OTSUS is, it uh, consists of a depolitization and politics is always seen, still seen as a threat. So the the quick the the big question is can OTSUS to overcome issues of justice, equality, protection, reward, respect, or humanity? So it's still a position that Papua problem is still related with economic and welfare issues, very infrastructure heavy. And we, are, we can question again, it's development for, for who actually that we're doing, whose need is that? So the government per, uh, presume, assume that if economic development is achieved then conflict will be resolved on its own. But many Papuan says money can't buy soul. Uang tidak bisa membayar nyawa. So there's still uh, uh, the essence of bringing justice in, in, in this context. So it's, it's also uh, from my perspective is how the government is treating Papua now is undermining the conflict and development and the peace nexus. They highly concentrate on development, but they do not concentrate on the conflict resolution aspect or the peace aspect. And there is still no guarantee that development can be achieved, especially when there's still so many challenges under the so-called development aspect. Okay, so um, I think I'll end from here. Just I, I will not propose any solution at all, but I think uh, we still have to take serious action to deal with the Papuan issue in a more multi-dimensional way by by imposing the aspect of recognition, justice, humanity, respect, protection, and especially towards the OAP and all intervention. So we do not want to, we want to, it, um, we selalu mengindonesiakan Papua, tapi kita pernah mempapuakan Indonesia. So what we should do is, we need, still need to mempapuakan Indonesia. I think I'll end from that. I'm sorry if I took such a long time. Back to you, Bu Ersa. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Perkasa. And I really like the closing statement. Uh, it's time to mempapuakan Indonesia. I think that pretty sums up uh, the discussion today. And thank you, sorry, the, Mr. Dr. Perkasa's discussion. Um, it's very comprehensive, honestly. It feels like um, Papua 101, for those who are unfamiliar with Papua, it covers from historical aspect, um, economic and development, narratives, discourses, um, human rights, security, racism, conflict, identity construction and recognition, including the international and domestic dimension. So I think we will have lots um, of issues to discuss um, at the question and answer session. Um, and now moving on um, from East, we move to the West. Uh, we're looking at another group of marginalized community as well. Um, we now we will be talking to about uh, Aceh province where um, Dr. Samuels is going to present her work on HIV care, silence and agency in Aceh. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Samuels, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Erza. And, and thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be um, 
uh, to be to be able to uh, to have this discussion with you and and do that online while I'm here in the Netherlands uh, and we can still uh, see each other and and discuss, which I think is amazing. And I, I really uh, congratulate you um, all on on um, organizing this this um, great series of the Studium uh, Generale lectures. Um, so uh, um, yes. Um, I think I've, I've heard so many super interesting things already today, and, and uh, I hope I can uh, add a little bit from the perspective of Aceh and then particularly uh, people living with HIV in Aceh. So I think in my um, talk, I will go a bit, uh, dive a bit deeper into one group, as, as, as you said, Dr. Erza, in, in the um, uh, marginalized group. Um, because uh, something you, you, you both said, actually, um, uh, Dr. Erza and Dr. Perkasa, uh, the, like the, mentioned the importance of listening to marginalized communities, right? And to, to um, the voices that we don't usually hear, um, those voices that are silenced uh, and uh, that, that uh, do not always come true um, in public discourse as well. Um, I hope to come at the end of the talk to some some solutions. Though I think, uh, and 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 as sociologists, anthropologists, we all know that uh, we we often study the complexity of the social world. Uh, so one one thing is to stay with that complexity, but another thing is that I, I absolutely agree to that that we also should think ahead and what can our academic work work bring to to these issues, right? In terms of um, of thinking about the future, thinking about solutions. So I'm going to share my screen. But, um, wait, wait, wait. Hope you can see this. Can you see my slides in uh, in full screen? Yes. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Um, so yes, I'll talk about HIV care um, uh, silence and and agency in in RJ. and. Uh, in a, and, and I've, I've um, I picked this topic because HIV care is something I've been studying since 2013. My first project in Aceh actually was in, started in 2007 and it was studying um, the, the post-tsunami reconstruction process from this like very uh, ethnographic um, uh, viewpoint, right, but methodology, um, really asking um, how people were remaking their everyday lives in the aftermath of the tsunami with, with, the, with the, the, um, the, the immense losses that had occurred in um, mostly Banda Aceh where I did that, that research. And one thing that, that really struck me, and I've like, written a whole book about it, but one thing that really struck me, and I'm also writing about that in, in the book, is um, the, the narratives that people told me about that event and about the tsunami and the reconstruction process. This major, major crisis in, in people's lives. And then, um, and then how to go on from there. Uh, when I when I went to RJ, of course, as a Dutch research, uh, uh, researcher and knowing the whole colonial history and, and the, uh, especially also um, uh, the Dutch history in RJ with the RJ war and so on, um, that's, that was, of course, very sensitive. And then uh, with such a, a, a traumatic event, I, of course, um, was was very um, uh, careful, also a bit nervous, whether people would actually want to talk about that. Uh, and I went to Aceh in 2007, so three years after the tsunami, and indeed people did want to talk about it, like most people, there are some people who didn't, but wherever I came, uh, people wanted, to, like, were, were totally open to be interviewed, but also in more, more regular conversations, right, you're on a, on a bus, um, uh, or, or, um, or in a bachak or, uh, uh, or at, a, at a wedding party, and people would start talking to each other about the tsunami. So it was really a, um, a topic that was at, in 2007 still everywhere, and uh, people talking about it uh, all the time, basically. So narratives about the tsunami were basically everywhere, and, I, and, and one thing I noticed was that they were very embodied. I'm writing about that in my book. Then I went on to do a postdoc at the University of Amsterdam in this project on HIV and, uh, and going back to Aceh to study HIV care. Um, and of course, I, I knew many people in Aceh and, and, and had some starting points, uh, but met a, a rather different scene. 
one could say, because HIV and AIDS is not something that's talked about regularly in many places. It's very silenced, and people affected by HIV and AIDS are experiencing that silence, right? They have to, to navigate that silence, the stig stigma around it, but also be very careful what to say to whom, um, because as you probably know, uh, um, um, disclosure or public disclosure of their HIV status um, could have like very, very disastrous personal consequences. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So completely um, a different uh, scene in that sense, in terms of narrative and, and silence. And I've been um, uh, really interested in these dimensions, like the, the narrative ways that we, we shape our worlds, that we um, the, the stories we tell each other and how much these matter, right? And how these matter to accessing care, the narrative you tell about yourself and your illness, for example, um, in, in your, like the, in the, to your to your physicians or caretakers, um, in, in the kind of like access that you have to care, also the silences, the things that people don't say to each other. Um, so I've been working on this topic and uh, what I'm going to do is say a little bit about anthropology of silence, just a tiny little bit, before uh, I move to the, um, to the topic of, of HIV in RJ. Um, so I've been working on this topic of, um, uh, of silences for a bit now, collaborating with uh, um, Anna Drakoilovic, among others, of the University of Melbourne. Uh, with, a, with a broader agenda of saying, so as social scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, we tend to look mainly at what people say. Right? We study uh, the, the interviews, we analyze these interviews, we look at what they have told us, what they say. Uh, it's much harder to actually also attend to what people don't say. Um, all the things that are unsaid, the stories that are untold, um, and that, and uh, and yet we know that all these things matter like tremendously in everyday lives. Like the moments that people are silent, um, the times that they don't answer our questions. So in this in this special issue, which is uh, the the introduction is open access, and also my my contribution on Ache is open access in uh, in the journal History and, and Anthropology. So you can just down, download that. Um, we, we try to to bring attention to this, like how do we actually take into account silences more into our um, into our, our methodologies and also into our theoretical perspectives um, on whatever topic we're studying, but especially there where um, um, where things matter most to people, right? Where in, in times of crisis, so migration, violence. Um, histories of violence uh, and, and, and illness. Um, so there are many ways to approach this, and it's not easy, obviously, right? How do we interpret that which is silence? How do we know what people meant or intended uh, with silence, if they intended something at all? Uh, however, I do think there are ways to approach this methodologically, and I think one way for me personally uh, is listening closer to narratives even, right? Um, uh, and, and we see that also with ethnographic work when we are interviewing people multiple times, for example, and the story changes. So at other points in time, they may say things that they didn't say before. Um, also with triangulation, of course, we, we may get another story from other sources. Um, but listen then closely to these narratives where uh, where things are unsaid or remain unsaid, also being very attentive to our own interview and observation practices. Uh, and and I've like, when I like when I started to do, I started to notice much more and be much more aware of these moments where people actually didn't really answer my questions and maybe deliberately so, right? Because topics were too sensitive or people just didn't want to think about this. And how do we deal at, with that as, um, as sociologists and anthropologists? And then, of course, there are stories that sometimes are literally whispered, like rumors or, um, or stories that, that, um, uh, that, that people feel can actually not be, or should actually not be shared. Finally, I think, and, and then coming back to the theme of today also, it's, it's tremendously important to, to attend to these narratives and stories that are spoken at the edges of, of of narrative possibility, as I put it, but also 
of of public discourse, right? The, the voices that are usually not not heard um, uh, for various reasons. And I think we have a um, an academic and also societal role in that as um, as social scientists. Um, and perhaps also uh, uh, a final point on this um, uh, tracing silences is that we the, that we think of these tracing silences in a very historical way. Like how do silences reverberate um, uh, through uh, colonial, post-colonial histories through the contexts and the, the limits of speech also that are created through these histories, right? Power imbalances, for example. Um, and in my research, on, on HIV, uh, history of colonialism and, and, and also more recent violence in Aceh has strongly affected uh, the healthcare system, um, uh, but also the uh, more, more broadly poverty and, um, and possibilities for people to, to access care and their marginalization. So, um, so I think of these as, as very uh, uh, broad, um, context and, and I think Dr. Perkasa also mentioned the importance of this this uh, historical context um, in, um, in, in, in in limiting and and enabling what can be said and and what remains unsaid. Um, so uh, as, as I mentioned, I did this uh, research on the tsunami uh, between 2007 2009, mostly continuing. Um, going there every year till 2012, uh, and then finishing my PhD on that topic. Um, and then in 2013, I went back to um, to Aceh to do research on the, on HIV care for one year. Um, again, um, ethnographic research, uh, and um, my methods were were mostly very very anthropological. Uh, the, the participants' observation and uh, and and in that qualitative interviews, and as you can imagine, with a topic so sensitive, that um, uh, that needed quite some negotiation of access, building of trust with people before I could actually uh, do such interviews. Uh, and it requires a lot of like ethical and 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 um, self reflection of the of the researcher. And it's not a, a topic where you can just come in for three days and and do a series of interviews and and go out. People really need to get to know you and trust trust you, um, as I experienced as well. There is um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about HIV and Aceh later, but I can already say that uh, at least at the time the number of um, of people diagnosed with HIV and AIDS was was very low comparatively. Um, so I think end of 2014, uh, 300 people in total had ever been diagnosed with HIV or AIDS, mostly AIDS actually, in Aceh, uh, which compared to Papua is 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 very minimal. Right? If, if you, we think of high numbers of HIV prevalence, then we think mostly of Papua. So many people have actually asked me, why did you go to Aceh to study HIV? And I'd like to answer that question immediately um, because if there, <laughs> perhaps ironically, but if there's not a lot of case, cases of HIV, um, then for those who are affected by, uh, by the virus, who are effect, affected by HIV and AIDS, um, accessing care is usually even much more difficult because there is a little awareness and, and there's um, a fewer facilities. And also I was interested in how this, this would work in Aceh's post-tsunami, post-conflict and um, um, uh, co context and the context of, of uh, Sharia implementation as well. So these were reasons for me to study HIV care in Aceh, uh, but, but the, the support was also quite limited there. There was a, a very active uh, HIV support group in Banda Aceh, and I did most of my participant observation with this group. Um, and that meant uh, accompanying people to the hospital, the two um, um, uh, uh, clinical meetings with physicians, uh, giving people support. Uh, that's what they did, like moral support, and, and so on. So a bit um, uh, pep talks, but also information on HIV and uh, uh, and some activism where uh, more support from government was deemed to be needed. Um, 
of course, in this this time and age, we can continue uh, um, research forever because we we have all these like digital media. So I I've, I've been in touch with um, with at least some of my interlocutors since 2014. Um, continuing to see how things develop in RJ, but from a distance. I've been there briefly in 2019. I hope to, to go again, um, if possible. Um, yeah, I, I would say after the pandemic, but I think uh, we should be more careful than that, but simply if possible. Uh, but but uh, I think it's it's tremendously important for um, uh, for this kind of research to um, to get a longer longer term view. Perhaps very briefly, oh, I mean this, oops, sorry. Um, very briefly, uh, something on HIV and AIDS, and I think many of you actually know, um, but I'd like to just have mentioned it. So what is, what is HIV? That's the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, and it's, it's a virus that attacks uh, our immune system slowly often so the virus invades cells and 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 disables them like disables these 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 cells that that fight for our, our immune system right so it, it affects that and and for some people it does that very slowly and then um uh, people infected uh with hiv but uh, could 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 not sometimes not notice for years on end, sometimes even 10 years until they start to show symptoms, often sooner though, I have to say. But um, but this means like the, the virus can go right, rather slowly in that sense, um, uh, attacking the immune system. Um, and then um, uh, it has several stages, but at some point, uh, because the immune system becomes so weak, um, it becomes prone to infections. And you see a lot of, of different uh, infections affecting uh, people uh, uh, living with HIV and AIDS. Um, tuberculosis is perhaps the, the, the most uh, common. Um, uh, so AIDS, um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, is the stage where people really get sick. And they get sick from like these other um, uh, infections, right? So people get sometimes like diagnosed with with, with tuberculosis, um, uh, in severe cases, toxoplasmosis, maybe other uh, other things. Um, and often that, if there's no testing prior to that, often that is only the point where people start noticing that something is wrong and that it might be AIDS. Um, they may have been living with it for a very long time at that point, right? Um, so uh, uh, HIV transmission, uh, and very important, I think, to, to mention, does not take place through, through the air like COVID. Um, it doesn't take place by like shaking hands or, um, or even hugging or even drinking from the same glass. HIV transmission really um, uh, takes place to, to mostly through blood um, uh, connection. And that can be uh, an effective blood transfusion. It can be sharing needles, whether in, mostly we see that in injecting drug use, uh, right? But it can happen also to through um, unhygienic needles in other places. Um, has happened, but it's not very common, I have to say. Uh, and and through um, uh, sexual intercourse. So. Um, and finally, uh, um, sadly, also transmit transmission from mother to child at birth, right? Already uh, before the baby is born, usually or or, or during birth, um, the vision can uh, the the virus can be transmitted. However, fortunately, um, we have antiretroviral medication, and what this medication does is help the immune system kick the virus out, <laughs> basically, and, uh, and improve that immune system. And uh, um, in that way, we, we don't have a cure yet. So HIV always remains somewhere in the system, but can be in like very, very, very small amounts. And that means that people who are on antiretroviral therapy, and if it goes well, then kick, like their, their bodies kick out most of the virus, basically, and um, they can live quite normally um, like any other person with a chronic illness. They can also um, uh, have children 
uh, without transmitting the virus to their partners and children if the virus is sufficiently suppressed, right? So, so um, in, in, in theory, with medication, a quite normal, as people say it also in the research, right? A quite normal life with HIV is possible. Um, in practice, we see that there are many barriers still in accessing medication. This is kind of this medication that you have to take every day. Uh, so you have to be quite diligent, uh, right? In, in, in taking this medication, um, but also in accessing uh, medication. Uh, people often have to travel long distances still to get that every month, and we'll, we'll get to that um, a little bit more um, in a later slide. Um, so the, the first case of, of HIV in Indonesia was uh, um, recognized in 2000, uh, in, in 1987, um, but in Aceh only in 2004, um, a, a few months before the tsunami hit. Uh, as I mentioned, there's low prevalence in 2000s, like after the tsunami, um, some, uh, especially in the capital Banda Aceh, some services for HIV care and testing were set up. And then these were elaborate, like, like um, um, uh, spreads to other districts in the province as well. Uh, and then the, the, the support group was um, created with, um, with um, um, uh, funding um, from abroad in the first place and then um, substantiated through the, through the uh, like finally through the global front and, and uh, national level later on. Um, uh, I mentioned low prevalence that's compared to Papua, but I do have to say that cases have gone up uh, quite rapidly also since 2014, sadly, and of course, um, as people uh, always said in Aceh, it's 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 Gunung as it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we don't know, right? Because so many people do not get tested, and we, we have absolutely no idea. Also, ep epidemiologists know that there's like uh, usually this 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 large number of people who don't get tested ever, um, uh, and, and we are actually not not quite sure. Um, there's a very high stigma, which is one reason why people do not get tested. Uh, um, and and uh, uh, we have heard uh, stories of people being um, uh, really kicked out of their villages, uh, children being denied access to school, also huge economic losses. It, it's, it's often um, rather uh, poor people, not everyone. Actually, it's, it's uh, people with low economic resources, but then if their um, uh, neighbors find out about their neighbors, their village uh, surroundings find out about the HIV um, uh, infection, then what we see is, is uh, a lot of economic loss. So people being denied jobs, day labor, for example, driving a truck, uh, if that was what they do, but also selling food in the schoolyards. One, one woman that um, um, I interviewed who, um, who made her living by selling food in the schoolyard. But then uh, when, when the village um, found out, she was denied that option, which deprived her of, of an income. Um, so how, like a question that, that bothers many people um, that I talk to in Aceh who are like not, have nothing to do with HIV. And many people, when I, when I, when I told like on my research about HIV and AIDS, people were usually shocked saying, well, what HIV? There's no HIV in Aceh. There's no AIDS in Aceh. Well, there is. Uh, and, and people were really shocked uh, um, saying, well, well, that's a sign of our moral degradation, right? Um, that's, that's a sign of because it's like a, a drug use and extramarital um, sexual, sexual relations. And um, people were really often immediately giving that a moral, moralized interpretation. Um, uh, and, and also thinking of AIDS as sort of this, this, this for, foreign threat invading Aceh. And, and, and I think if you think along historical lines also, um, this is another, um, another, to many people, it's another threat that comes on top of uh, a lot of like conflict and, and, and violence that, they, that they've seen already. Um, so it's it's easily sort of like narrated in this in this sense of a of coming coming from abroad, coming from other places, from Jakarta, from Medan, from Kuala Lumpur, Penang, um, uh, and indeed, in a way, it did, of course, as it does everywhere. Uh, it comes it comes from other places, uh, and and uh, indeed, in, in many 
for many men who went to Marantau, who went to, during the conflict, also for conflict reasons, to Jakarta, to uh, Malaysia, got infected and, and brought the virus back home, transmitted to their, their wives and children, um, ultimately. But that's one narrative. Of course, there's many other ways um, in which uh, the virus uh, is, is transmitted and has, uh, as, as I mentioned, and has entered Aceh in a way, right? Um, then there is like, it's, what's very important in Aceh, of course, is, is the religious interpretations of the, um, of the situation. I mentioned that idea of moral degradation, um, which, which was especially painful with the identity of Aceh and image of Aceh as the most pious part of Indonesia. So people linked it to that. But then, um, interestingly, um, I also attended, for example, a, 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 um, a, a large meeting workshop with religious leaders, really Ustads um, uh, from a particular districts came together to discuss uh, HIV. And one of the, the important sentiments there was also, um, well, Islam is compassion, right? So Islam, uh, so, so the important thing is to think of HIV in terms of compassion, not to stigmatize people or to abandon them or judge them, anyone, but, but actually to think of how to, can we create compassionate care for people? Uh, so I think there's also in that sense, a lot of potential uh, and also, if you look at the narratives, the, the, the stories that people living with HIV themselves tell, uh, because strikingly, these were quite similar to the stories I heard from people telling about the tsunami. Uh, people telling about the tsunami, this major crisis in their life in which they lost so much um, in terms of hikmah, right? What is the hikmah? What is the, the wisdom in, in this disaster that's affecting me? I have to learn from it. Um, and and uh, it's, it's a choba'an, right? It's a test uh, to see uh, maybe for me to become a better Muslim or it's a second chance for me to live. And interestingly, that's, that's for, not for everyone, but for quite some people I interviewed with HIV, um, that's, that's a quite similar narrative. I right? where people say, yeah. it's, it's like the moment I heard about the HIV diagnosis. I, I wanted to die. Sometimes people say I wanted like I wanted to earth to split and just disappear into it. Um, and it felt like the sky collapsed, really. But but then when talking to other to, to nurses, to peer support workers, slowly coming to understand the, the, the virus, and uh, uh, many people started to interpret it in the same this along similar lines as, as the tsunami, actually, as as a got given disaster crisis test actually for them and a second chance in a way um, um, to, um, to Im improve their lives as well, which I think is, is, is really interesting and also important in terms of coping, right? And in terms of creating a narrative of the, of the future in a moment of crisis. Now I have to say all of these narratives, all of these things are not, um, are not public, public discourse. Right? Because none of the people I met, except one actually, of the people I met in Aceh publicly spoke out about their HIV infection. They deemed that too dangerous um, uh, for their for their uh, personal safety, for their for their everyday lives, which they try to live as normal as possible. So sometimes they told family members or some family members. I have interviewed people who had told no one surrounding them, no family members, no friends only the, the peer support group uh, workers. Um, but they would, like people would definitely not tell neighbors, uh, neighbors and, and, um, um, and the schools of their children and so on. And um, this brings us also uh, to, to some of the barriers in, in accessing care. Um, where stigma is a stigma and dis discrimination, discrimination also in the healthcare system, but the fear of involuntary non-disclosure is a huge, huge barrier for people, uh, especially if you go look at the Puskas Mass level, at the district hospital level, um, where um, uh, sometimes uh, people, um, if if it's known that that they have HIV, like the the the, the letters like HIV are written in large on their file. Which means that every social worker, every nurse in that like Puskas Mas level can can know about the um, uh, the patient's status, and we know that 
officially people um, uh, should not uh, yeah, there, there should be confidentiality confidentiality but in such a um, a closed setting where, where so many people know each other that's going to be very difficult and there we've seen uh, a lot of cases of, of involuntary disclosure but people were also afraid in the in the the, the provincial hospital um, to be recognized by someone from their like from their social network saying like, what are you doing here um, and uh, um, to to create suspicion in that sense this was especially difficult for women um, because of the the, the limited mobility more limited mobility uh, and and as you as you probably know that for for a man um, mobility was much more freely regulated they could come and go they could go to the city and so on to get to access their care and i have to say that for for hiv care people have to go to the city every month get to the provincial hospital or now also more and more district hospitals fortunately every month to get their medication for women that created suspicion right like what are you doing in the city on your own every month like where like if you go from your village on on a bus or on a gojack or or whatever to to the village to the, to the city every month people people are suspicious um of of what you um of, of what you're doing there so uh so this this created a, a major barrier to access of course also there's transportation money especially for a lot of poor people um, um that uh, that's a, just a time to to the time of work to go to the hospital every month but also the um, uh, the money needed to um, to to travel for transport uh, for food on the way is um, um, is a problem. Um, and then sometimes there were these really tragic, I would say, bureaucratic barriers. And I'll I'll give one example. And and maybe I should mention also that this has to do. If you look at a larger healthcare system in Indonesia, and you all know more about that than I do, um, right? Where where we have a a healthcare system that's based on rujukan, um, so so transferal from from uh, one level to the next until you finally get at the um, the provincial and even perhaps in the the in Jakarta the capital, um, and, and which has its roots in colonial times and then was like really designed in, in the 19, 1950s. Um, and, and there are some bureaucratic hurdles as well in such a system uh, to accessing care. Uh, and one, I just wanted to share one uh, a particularly tragic uh, example where we visited a young woman in a faraway district. I won't mention the name. Uh, it's about 10 hours ride from Banda Aceh. So, so really far, far away in that sense. Um, in her village with the healthcare worker who knew about her HIV status um, because she had been tested in jail, in prison. She had been in prison um, and, uh, and there she'd been tested positive, but she was now on probation. So being on probation, she was not allowed to go out of the province on her own. Um, and the only way for her to go to the, to, to the provincial capital to access HIV care um, was with a probation officer with her. And you can imagine what would be needed there, right? So there would be transportation for the probation officer, there would be per, per diems, there would be accommodation and so on, a quite a large budget all in all to take this woman to, to the capital. And um, uh, the, uh, the health department said, well, simply there's no budget. We're, we're at the end of the year, we, like, we have, uh, there's, no, there's no budget for this. So it simply didn't happen. And, uh, and a couple of months later, she was rushed to the hospital um, by ambulance and, and sadly passed, passed away um, because she couldn't have access to uh, the HIV care on time. So I think there's these, these, these sometimes um, uh, bureaucratic hurdles in accessing care, especially if care is far away that we can, uh, we can think about if you think about solutions, right? So how do we provide care also in more remote areas? Um, just looking at the time, I won't go on for too long then, but um, um, very briefly, one, one more example of one woman, uh, a middle-class woman living in a, in a district some five hours away from Banda Aceh with um, two, two kids, one of whom was HIV positive. She herself was HIV positive and her husband had passed away. 
uh, in the, the previous year, quite recently. And um, uh, she really experienced this, this same um, uh, stigma and, and fearful of disclosure. So she was very afraid that her neighbors would find out about her HIV status, but she had to travel to Banda Aceh every month. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and that created a lot of moral suspicion, but in her case, it created a moral suspicion of a, a widow traveling to the capital every month. And people were thinking, well, she is, she is already finding a new partner there. What is she doing? Um, and people were very suspicious. And in her case, what she did was really use that. So she applied her lipstick and everything. And she, she joked with her neighbors, yes, yes, I'm looking for a new husband, which of course created a moral stigma, but one that she was less afraid of than, than the stigma that would befall her if people would suspect the true reason of her travel to the city. Um, and I've, I've analyzed that in the article in History and Anthropology in terms of, of how people navigate care and what they say, the silences. Um, uh, and and uh, and all at the same time visibility. So in her case, she made herself like visible in a particular way, in a healthy way. Also, looking healthy is very important for many people uh, with HIV to protect actually the secret of being infected by HIV. So to not to not speak in a way to keep the silence. And I think that is one uh, important conclusion for us as as social scientists thinking about silence and, and narrative and how people access healthcare. So I, like if you think about silence, we often think about silencing, right? Silencing marginalized populations and um, uh, silence as a very bad thing in a way. Uh, a more nuanced view, if you really look at individual cases is that in, in particular situations in, in people's lives, silence can also be very benign. People care through silence, through not telling each other everything. This particular woman, I call her Farida, in, in the paper, uh, for example, told her, her mother and, and a few family members about her HIV status, uh, but not her father. She said, my father has a heart condition. He cannot bear that knowledge. Right? So her silence about that in, in the family was also an act of care. Um, and and uh, I, I want to point here at the ways in which individuals in, in these the fraud situations also um, use silence to care and care for themselves. Um, so in that sense, also have a, um, um, a more nuanced look at silence where not everything always um, uh, needs to be spoken. And I think that is also the, um, uh, a bit of the predicament if you look at HIV care. Um, so here is a point, um, and thinking a bit in, in terms of solutions, uh, Dr. Erza, as you mentioned, right? But we should, should not only, I think the, the, the academic uh, work that we can do is very important, but also we should connect it to, okay, what so like practical impl implications of our work um, of, of uh, listening to marginalized voices, listening to these silences. Um, and I think a very important understanding HIV care in, in historical context. Um, Attending to the to to what people say and what they, but also what they don't say. Try to listen to these to these moments where they don't answer questions or where where you sense that part of the story remains unspoken. Um, I think with Farida, that was absolutely in, in I, I knew her for a, a year, but then also in our interview that I had, every time our conversation moved towards the topic of potential disclosure by right? potential. Um, involuntary disclosure where her, her neighbors and surroundings would find out about her HIV status, then she moved to another topic. And she, she, she really did not want to think that scenario. She really did not want to envision what would happen then, right? That was, that was just of um, uh, something that, that, that was too sensitive to even think about, I would say, in her case. Um, but I also mentioned here creating awareness of, of HIV. And I think, as I mentioned, that is maybe one of the predicaments that we're in um, with HIV care, creating more awareness, societal awareness, and also in the healthcare system of people like living with HIV and what it's like um, and what the barriers are, gender barriers to access care and so on, I think is, is tremendously important. Also to make people less afraid like general population less afraid of people living with HIV because as said, it doesn't transmit as, as, as tuberculosis or COVID, 
um, uh, and and there's like if 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 your kids like plays together with a, a child affected with HIV, there's 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 no risk of, of transmission, right? So people like creating that awareness is is very very important. Um, however. There's also a bit of a worrisome note there because what we're seeing in, in many countries around the world, including the Netherlands, um, including uh, countries where, where that are heavily affected by HIV, especially in Africa, what we're seeing now is that there's a lot of awareness of HIV and there's medication and everyone's on medication. So it has become in that way it, or it's becoming a chronic condition, right? Like diabetes, you have to, to use medication every day. Um, and then you can live a, a rather normal life. And yet still that stigma is there. So the stigma seems to not disappear with awareness and medication only. So um, uh, I would say, yes, absolutely more awareness, but then also attending to those, um, uh, and, and of, of course, like awareness in the sense of prevention, very important, but then also attending to those who are actually infected by HIV, right? Caring for people. And, in, in, and, and I really like the phrase by Sarah Willen of, of creating inhabitable spaces of welcome, spaces where people feel welcome. Uh, so not only that they're not abandoned, not ignored, but actually extending care and asking like, like what do you need and how can we help you as a community um and i think that's i i know that it's a bit um utopia because it's 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 it very like very few places but we we do see it happening and we do see these these instances happening of where communities say we we actually we really welcome you and we um uh we care for you and 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 is there anything that we can help with and i think um uh, i i actually really like the the slogan i think of the 2019 hari aids dunia uh bukan oranya uh which which sort of summarize it all for me uh, there's a lot of work to be done um and i i realized that i've been speaking about ache a particular community in ache and uh perhaps to to um uh, by way of an ending, uh, I think that part of my story could apply to many other parts of Indonesia, right? and some of you may recognize this also from your own research or context. Um, on the other hand, I, I still think it's very important to see these, uh, these local dimensions like of the fear, uh, for example, in Aceh, of the fear of HIV uh, in, in the context of, uh, of a history of occupation and conflict. Um, uh, and, and what that does with societal attitudes um, to, to people living with HIV, and, and especially here also the, the religious context, of course. Um, so uh, I'm going to, um, to almost end uh, uh, on that note. Um, um, uh, perhaps by, by finally uh, emphasizing that I do think that um, uh, this nuance and this, this contextual perspective is needed um, also for the solutions we create, because there's no one size fits all solution uh, in, in healthcare that we can roll out over the world, uh, because people in different places have like different um, uh, cultural, social perspectives. And also we see already the, the, the gender dynamics and how living with HIV may differ for men and for women. Um, so ta more tailor-made solutions. And I, I really think that that we as social scientists, I really hope and think that we as social scientists can contribute that. So thank you so much for, um, for giving me the space to discuss with you. And I want to uh, finally echo also uh, Dr. Prakasa's um, um, comment at the beginning of his talk that um, I also really, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and I, I, I very much welcome your, your insights and, and comments. Um, thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Samuels. I think that's a very insightful uh, presentation, especially in looking uh, at the different dimensions, well, not specific dimensions, and how we view silence as a way um, to actually clearly communicate experiences. Um, and I think, considering my background is not sociology, I think that's a really insightful for me as, as a new way of looking at that. Um, and I think if there are two common threads that I can um, summarize between what uh, Dr. Prakasa has mentioned and what Dr. Samuels has uh, presented as well, I think the first one is that um, if we compare about these two uh, presentations, we look at, at how um, this 
marginalized community uh, has used different mechanisms to actually voice their experiences. Um, Dr. Perkasa, for example, mentioned about the use of technology and social media within the Papuan community of how they um, express their experiences and their oppressions. And then Dr. Samuels mentioned about how silence is actually being used for those people um, to, to, you know, in a more primal instinct to survive, uh, I would say that. Um, but also, I think um, one of the conclusion there that is um, of most important for us, as well as how we can create more spaces for these voices, um, or quoting will and spaces of welcome for these voices to be heard more. So I think um, building from this conclusion uh, and then the previous discussion, I think I would now like uh, to open the floor for questions and answers. Um, so I think the, for the first session, we can have around uh, three questions first. And I also got some um, sponsor message, some sponsor that you can actually ask in both English or Indonesia, um, because I heard Dr. Samuels is uh, fluent in Indonesia, in Bahasa Indonesia, and of course, Dr. Perkasa is very, very, very fluent in Bahasa Indonesia. So please feel free, um, you can use the uh, raise hand feature in Zoom, or you can type your questions uh, in the chat box, and then I will relay the questions to the speakers. So feel free if you have any uh, questions. Okay, um, so we have uh, the first one is Romeo. Um, you can directly address your questions uh, either to Dr. Samuels or Dr. Perkasa. Uh, Phil, uh, please, uh, Romeo. Okay. Yeah, uh, is my voice heard? Yes, yes, Hello? loud and clear. Yes, loud and clear. Um, before I ask, uh, I guess I want to say thank you to both the presenter and the moderator for engaging in this uh, discussion. So I would like to ask question to both the pre both presenters. For the first is what I've got gathered from Papua's Papua's uh, response, uh, Memoria Passion is uh, is that what I've assumed is that there is a lot of toxic nationalism in Indonesia in the way it approaches in the issue of well, Memoria Passion is the the violence the violence in Papua is not uh, is perpetuated by the toxic radical nationalism that Indonesia is approached this issue with. Because I've seen a lot, uh, from the presentation, I've seen a lot of method that Indonesia approach on how to integrate or how to communicate with Papua in their perspective, in Indonesian perfect perspective, without regarding their perspective. So what, I'm, what, I, what, what I would like to ask is, is there a benefit to teach this kind of notion that radical nationalism is bad in a way to approach this kind of issue because I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of issue regarding Indonesian being over proud or being too proud of their own country that they are disregarding their well opposition in this case Papua and the way this approach and this approach is to me rather will not will not exactly perpetuate kindness rather it's violence this one time. And for the second question is regarding to the HIV silence and invisibility. Um, what I would like to ask is that, is there any priority to what should we, uh, what we should prioritize in dealing with in the case, in specifically in the case for Ache? Because what, from what I've heard, from what I've seen from the presentation is that there is a lot of issue regarding with history and anthropology in, and the loca location and the demographic in Aceh itself, because there is an issue with religion, issue with history, issue with, well, patriarchy and all of that, because there's a lot of issue regarding, ah, yes, uh, the issue of sex education is very sacrilegious and should not be talked about. And then there is another issue like, oh, those who have been infected by HIV is guaranteed to be a bad person because people ignorance in how HIV works, even though HIV is more complex than what they seem to know. Like this, is there a priority that we should take care? Of? Is there is, is it education? Is it the religion, or is that is there something else? That's all for my question. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, um, Romeo, Mr. Romeo. Um, I think uh, we still have time for two more questions. Um, so feel free to raise hand. Uh, Bisa angkat tangan dalam bahasa Indonesia atau dalam bahasa Inggris, silahkan. Um, okay, so um, we have one question in the chat box, so I'll just read it. Um, 
Okay, so this is from Ms. Olga Maheswari from Department of Sociology, uh, year of 2019. Uh, I want to ask a question to Mr. Pijandika Praset Prasetya. Okay, uh, Perkas, I think. <laughs> okay, what things that needs to be done to solve various problems in Papua, other than making policies or providing a discourse on solutions? Is it necessary to provide a dialogue uh, space that can open up opportunities for reconciliation for the Papuan people with the authorities or policymakers or stakeholders so that the solution provided are in accordance with their needs and so that they can improve various aspects, both economic, social, and health? So I think um, this is a question about um, other, other solutions. Um, we can work on Papua. Can we do some sort of dialogue or negotiations, which includes um, all the stakeholders, different stakeholders and policymakers, both in Indonesia and in Papua? Okay. Um, and I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, if you still have one question, uh, either to Dr. Samos or Dr. Perkasa, please feel free to use the chat box or just raise your hand. I actually sort of have a little bit of question, if that's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to, uh, to moderate questions, but I do have some questions here. Um, I think the, the first one I think is for Dr. Perkasa, because um, my question is, um, how do we replace memories? Because I think you mentioned that uh, about the memories, about the collective suffering, the, that the collective memory of suffering that the Papuan people are having, and then it affects their view of Indonesia and other stuff. And I personally think that's one of the most difficult thing to change, to have any idea how we can actually replace those uh, collective memory of suffering to more happier memories, perhaps. Um, and then I think for Dr. Samuels, um, I'm curious whether there has been any changes in the stigmatization of um, HIV or people living with AIDS through time, considering that there has been an increase in information regarding HIV AIDS. And then did you find that in Aceh as well? I mean, is there um, an advancement in um, a less negative stigmatization or it tends to be worse for those uh, people living in Aceh with uh, HIV AIDS? I'm just curious about, uh, about that actually. Okay. <clears throat> so if, um, I think we have uh, three questions at the moment already, and maybe we can give the time to uh, both Dr. Samuels and Dr. Parkasa to answer the questions. And for the audience, if you still have uh, other questions in mind, uh, feel free to use the chat box or uh, use the raise hand feature after these uh, questions are being answered. Okay, so maybe I'll first give the time to Dr. Parkasa, if that's okay. Okay, thank you, Buersa. Uh... First of all, let me respond to the question from Romeo. Um, thank you for such a critical question and observation. I think um, if I could word your 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 concern on the issues that you raise, it's we're dealing uh, on the so-called contested nationalism. So um, why then you mention it's a toxic nationalism? Because it it tends to be an intrusion and from intrusion of a, a, a form of a forced nationalism which kind of um, undermine the so-called identity of the local Papuan. So let's just make a comparison, right? You know, why it becomes a contested nationalism? I think it's, it's really um, easily said and very uh, transparent in terms of what the Papuan are currently facing. And I, I think I've mentioned very, very clearly that the, the so-called issues of marginalization, injustice, violence, or, or the how the how the the, the the government kind of perceived the Papuan as primitive, as underdeveloped, it all contributes towards their sense of identity, which finally contested the, the kinds of nationalism which the government tried to impose towards the Papuan uh, society. Let's compare with us, for example. We are the for I'm a Javanese, I'm a Javanese. Uh, citizens. I mean, and uh, I do not. I do not experience marginalization. I do not experience injustice. I do not have any memory of violence, which is perpetrated by the state. And people do not uh, stigmatize me as primitive. I have no problem whatsoever to receive the so-called uh, nationalism imposed by the the the, the government. It's a nationalism which kind of. Uh, um, urge me to kind of love my country, fight my, my country, but it's so different with the context of, 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 of in Papua. So I think in a, 
a way to kind of uh, deconstruct the so-called contrast to nationalism. So you, there is no other way but to solve the issues which I have mentioned, the complexity of Papua. I think once there are politics of recognition, once there are uh, ways to, to kind of um, to, uh, to overcome marginalization, once there is a way to kind of overcome violence, I think there is there is there there are no no challenges anymore because, like I mentioned before in my presentation, because uh, there, there once was a time when when the Papuan really um, really uh, acknowledged that they have a dual nationalism, they have a, a Indonesian nationalism, and they also have a Papuan nationalism. So it's but uh, in the current situation, they only admit that they, they only have a single kind of nationalism, which is the Papuan, because it is a sense of frustration, a sense of grievance that they have experienced, and there are, there are no effort whatsoever to resolve the, 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 the human suffering that they, ha they have experienced so far. So, so I think, um, I hope that I, I have answered uh, your question, because uh, it, National, nationalism won't, won't be contested ever or if, if the Papuan do not experience such a memory of passionist, which I've mentioned earlier. And um, I don't, uh, for the question of the, the I forget who, who, who raised that question, but anyway, I think dialogue is a crucial element uh, within uh, effort to, to, um, to, to solve the complexity of Papua. But one one um, difficult thing, which uh, currently um, or people experience uh, amidst this dialogue discourse is first, the government do not really show their intention to to make dialogue. Actually, I think there is no no fault whatsoever to to even ask the the OPM or the the KKB to have a dialogue with. With, with with them but uh, the, the the government or the policy seems to to avoid such thing and the other thing which which kind of complicate the matters is that um, it, it's so difficult to find Papua representation I think it's, it's quite different with what we have in Aceh I mean Aceh I see it's quite solid uh, there is solidity in terms of their struggle I mean uh, uh, with the gum but Papua it's very fragmented. So um, even when Pre President Joko, we invited 60 tri uh, tribal leaders there, um, many other uh, leaders does not acknowledge the, the legality of those people to represent uh, the, the needs of the Papuan. So representation is a problem. But anyway, I think a dialogue uh, should be initiated. And, and I think um, the government has made a, a, a slight mistake when when, when uh, constructing the, the special autonomy, because I think they, they only have special autonomy at, at, at this stage, right? To resolve the complexity of Papua. But again, it, 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 it has started uh, with, with, uh, with a deviation in terms of uh, they do not uh, um, involve uh, many elements of the society. So, so it's, it's been highly critical. So again, the special autonomy is now facing a legitimacy problem just as the first special autonomy. So, but uh, in any case, I think we should always uh, try to uh, promote uh, this, uh, this dialogue element in every in a policy intervention that uh, will be conducted in, in, uh, in Papua. So it's, 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 it's currently it's really top-down approach, right? Even, even though this infrastructure, I think it's really top-down. So that's why uh, many uh, Papuan are not very skeptic in terms of who is who is actually the government trying to develop? I mean, is it the Papuan or the, the migrant population? I think that's that's a, a sign of, of uh, why such skepticism emerged because of the neglect of dialogue in in this case. And Buersa question: It's quite difficult um, to replace memories of forgiveness, right? Uh, I always uh, when I talk to 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 um, local local uh, authorities or, or even the, the the state apparatus and the uh, I always propose um, for them to to make a breakthrough towards resolving the problem in Papua as, as I think the one of the the worst case of this uh, oppressive memories is is pretty much related to to violence and human rights violation 
So what I propose to them is, of course, first of all, you, you have to approach, you have to show their, your commitment to resolve conflict and violence. You have to show their commitment. We do, we do not need to think about massive high-level conflict in Papua, such as the, the Wamena case or the Panea massacre or so forth and so forth. You just stick in one particular violence and you just show your commitment to the people that we want to solve this problem. And of course, there is always uh, various local, uh, local conflict resolution and mechanism, which we could study to, to kind of um, use it for, for our intervention to solve uh, these this atrocities. I mean, so I think um, even though uh, the Papuan really stick on their motto of that, we cannot replace uh, souls with money, but I think this, they, they do can have a sense of forgiveness if we show their uh, our mercy and, and, and our, our true intention to kind of um, approach approach them for for resolution and, and kind of um, act them as part of the, the subject matters which can replace uh, or promote a conflict resolution. But again, Buersa, I think it's, it's, it's not easy uh, endeavor to do, especially this uh, memory of of uh, oppression and violence has been going for such a long time. So, so, but but anyway, we must start at doing, uh, start at doing something to to resolve these these issues. I think that's that's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prakasa, for the concise answers for the questions. Um, I think moving on to Dr. Samuels. Um, I think there's two questions here. Yes, thank, thank you. Thanks, thanks for the questions uh, and also for this, this very interesting um, um, discussion also on Papua. And um, yeah, I think we, what, what we're seeing here um, is how crucial dialogue is, but also awareness of history and, and power differences um, in, in, in such dialogues. I'm, I'm, I'm really um, glad that that's um, highlighted. Um, so uh, for the uh, um, uh, Romeo, thank you for raising the issue of of sex education and the and the priorities there. Uh, and I think I I I, um, I haven't really spoken in um, in this talk about the the very sensitive issues that we see in many places, but particularly in Aceh, it comes to sex education, it comes to condom distribution, um, things that are are absolutely pivotal not only for for um, combating HIV uh, and preventing HIV transmission um but uh but also for for um, um, uh, many other um, health related issues um and uh yeah at the time that i was there there was actually a need to, a lot of discussion on on sex education a lot very sensitive topic on how how that is done in schools how it how it's allowed to be done in schools and uh it's, we see that that teachers are, are also they're very wary of making mistakes there, right? And being called out um, uh, for such mistakes. So it's, it's um, uh, yeah, that, that there is a lot of um, people are, are afraid of um, doing sex education in the wrong way or in like what is considered the wrong way and then, um, and then, and then facing the consequences. So I think, uh, I, I do think, and I know that, that non-governmental organizations in Arche uh, and organizations like PKBE, uh, um, and, and also um, uh, the Achinese governmental departments of, of education, for example, are, are really working on that. Um, in terms uh, of um, uh, priorities, and that's a, that's a really interesting question, because I do think, as we see with many health-related issues, that we, we should think more about an integrated approach, right? And there's absolutely um uh well there's limited resources so you have to make choices sometimes right but on the other hand uh it's it's also not a a a sort of like chronological trajectory where you first start with prevention and you then do care for example or you first start with education um and then um uh, and then with uh um with thinking about about stigma um so i i do think um, that is, it, it, it's very important to have that integrated approach. And, and though there's a lot there of, in HIV care, a lot of attention for prevention, I always 
try to emphasize that at the same time, we should take care of people who are now already affected by HIV and AIDS. Um, also to prevent transmission, by the way, because if people are taking their medication, as I mentioned, and they're taking antiretroviral medication and taking it diligently and suppressing the virus, then chances of transmission are extremely, become extremely low, so that we can also stop uh, HIV from spreading. So, so if, if you want that sort of like, I do think that caring for people is a value in and of itself, but, but if, yeah, if we want that kind of argument, I do think uh, it's also important epidemiolo in, in epidemiological terms. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Erza, I think, uh, so your questions on information, also misinformation, right, information, and, and whether it's um, a fact, like whether it's effective at all, if I understand you correctly. Yeah, so I, I do see that socialisasi actually does, does have impact. So I do think that's tremendously important of like good socialization in, uh, in companies, in neighborhoods, um, in, in schools and right in the different places, having these like meetings and, and creating awareness. So of, of the, you know, the in right, the, the right information, we do see that um, that there is absolutely also misinformation and rumors going around on, about HIV. One persistent rumor that we like that we're hearing in many many places around the world, actually, and also in RJ that I've heard several times, um, is that people living with HIV would be so angry that they would deliberately start infecting other people. Right, so that, that, that like rumors that they would do that in, in an elevator or something like that. And these rumors have been going around and these are rumors in the sense of like unfounded stories, right? Un, um, um, uh, and, and really misinformation with the effect of making people uh, very afraid of uh, those living with HIV and, and, and immensely increasing the stigma because people who hear these rumors are like, don't know if it's true, but maybe better stay away from these people, right? And that's and I think and and, and that's wherever um, you're absolutely right. That is like giving the right information, um, and also talking about these like like actually picking out these rumors as absolutely untrue um, uh, is is extremely important. So I I I, I absolutely su support also in terms of like the, the priorities that we just um, discussed. Uh, upscaling these like socialization activities. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Samuels, um, for the answers. Um, I think we still have time for maybe around two questions. Um, so if you still have some burning questions in your head or you still think that you need further information or clarification, um, please feel free um, to use the raise hand feature once again or just to use the chat box. Um, and as a reminder as well, you can also ask in Bahasa Indonesia or in English, even in Japanese language, I think some of us will be able to translate Japanese language anyway, so <laughs> feel free. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, we have one question from um, Filza Rahma. Okay, um, I'll just read it from the chat box. So it's a question for uh, Dr. Perkasa. How can we manage the pop ones to have a good perception that they are part of Indonesia, while on the other hand, uh, they said that Indonesia colonized them. Uh, that's an open quote, colonized them. They receive a lot of exclusion, discrimination, and violence towards them. Do we really only have two options between uh, this matter, making Papua still part of Indonesia or letting it go? Is it the best choice for everyone if Papua remain as a part of Indonesia? Okay, that's a complex question. And okay, so probably I'll let um, Dr. Perkasa to answer the questions first and then feel free to raise hand and then uh, use the chat box again if you still have questions. Dr. Perkasa, the time is yours. Thank you, Puerza. I think, let me say it this way. I mean, we can see PAP1 problems as a complex issue, but we also can see it as a very simple issue. I think the question, your question is very, very straightforward. How can we change the, per the perception of PAP1? Uh, While well, on the other hand, they demand from uh, a referendum or so forth. Well, I, have, I, I think I, I have explained very, very clearly on the various complexity that the government must solve one by one. They could not only 
focus on one issues and see that Papua is only an economic matter issue. That's a mistake. Because first of all, from OTSUS part one, they have quote unquote failed to increase the welfare of local Papuan. So what else do they have? What else could they rely on if the special autonomy part one has failed? Now there's another special autonomy part two, which is still a big question whether it could solve the problem or it, the fate remains the same as part autonomy uh, part one. So I think I, I, I have, I have proposed various dimension of issues that must be solved one by one. We cannot wait if, if the government really rely on the economic dimension to resolve conflict. I think that's it's nonsense, Sami. It's really nonsense. When can we, when can we start to feel the benefit of this, this economic development when in, in one sense, the conflict escalate day by day. And the other hand, there is no guarantee at all that the development will work under the outsource space uh, part two. So, okay, while well, we wait for this whole uh, hope on the, the, the success of special autonomy part, part two, resolve the other issues, resolve the conflict issues, make their own uh, policy system, not just what is currently happening, which, uh, killing, shooting, that's it. But there's no such integrated uh, mechanism to resolve conflict. That also concerns the, the historical aspect. Come on, invite people to tell their story on what is really happening in the late 1960s. Create history from below. If the current history of Papua is deemed valid. So why should we be afraid of that? There's nothing wrong with to contest history because history is, 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 is a, it's a free arena where people can, 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 can express their experience and thoughts on what really happened on that time. So, so make the historical of Papua more diverse through the discourse, through, even though it, with the, the risk of we we do have a contested contested historical finding. So let the subaltern speak. And there is also issues of sort of uh, discrimination, marginalization, which 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 could be solved without we have to wait for the economic development to 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 be fruitful. And we also have issues on, for example, um, um, marginalization and also. Uh, human rights and violence. We could we could do the such intervention without having to wait for this special autonomy to take into effect. So there are many things that we could do. But so, so let's just do not waste time and start to to solve all those problems in a simultaneous way. So I think that's the best solution that we can we, we can do. Back to you, Guerza. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Perkasa. Um, I think that's a very concise answer as well on um, the, the, the disparate facets of problems in Papua and how we can actually um, not, not personally contribute, perhaps, but we can discuss about the different ways of we can actually um, deliver, start delivering peace, perhaps, in Papua. Um, I think looking at the clock, I think we have no more time for questions at this time but i hope um, it's been a very engaging discussion and it's been a fruitful discussion um, obviously this is a very productive way to spend the afternoon so allow me to wrap up our discussion for today uh, before uh, giving back the time to the master of ceremony so i think um, one of our tasks as an academic is not just about uh, advancing knowledge but also we were also given the task about how to advance humanity as a whole and I think um, our discussion today has proved uh, to be something really interesting because we, we give space and we give time to those marginalized community uh, uh, who are sometimes faced with difficulties in voicing uh, um, their experiences, their interests. Um, and so I think um, following this discussion, I think we can actually come back to our homes and start thinking about ways where we can actually uh, give more spaces or spaces of welcome uh, to these people who are what we consider as the marginalized or people who are often oppressed. 
So um, I think that sums up our discussion for today. And thank you very much. Um, I would like to say a massive thank you for Dr. Perkasa for the discussion and also for uh, Dr. Samuels. And I hope we can continue this in um, other events as well or other types of um, uh, academic exchange. So thank you very much um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you enjoyed our discussion today and I will return now the time back to uh, our MC. Thank you very much and good afternoon. All right, thank you very much for the amazing and absolutely eye-opening materials from two of our speakers and of course to our moderator who led the session very engagingly. Before we can wrap up today's event, I would like to invite Mrs. Anik Susanti, SPD MSI, as the head of the undergraduate sociology study program to give a closing remarks to Mrs. Anik. The time is yours. Okay. I uh, speak in Indonesia. Baik, terima kasih Bapak Ibu, Miss Andi Mary dari uh, yang mengisi acara hari ini, Bapak Viandika Perkasa, terima kasih banyak sudah menyempatkan waktu. Ibu Ersa Kilian selaku moderator dalam acara ini, terima kasih sehingga acara ini bisa berjalan sebagaimana mestinya, sehingga para hadirin termasuk juga saya bisa mendapatkan wawasan yang baru dengan sudut pandang yang baru atas kasus yang ada di Papua dan juga ada di Aceh. Baik, demikian. Saya kembalikan kepada MC. Terima kasih Bapak-Ibu yang sudah hadirin. Ya. Oke, okay, thank you so much um, Mrs. Anik for the speech. And last but not least, uh, I would like to invite all attendees here to take a picture together. So for those who are able to open your camera, please. We'll be waiting like in one, two minutes. Okay, we're still waiting for you guys to open your camera and to take a picture together. Siva, seadanya aja Siva. Oke okay, Mbak. Oke, okay, so uh, let me screenshot this in three, two, one. Okay, probably once again. Three, two, one. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I guess by having the closing remarks from Mrs. Anik Susanti and photo session, our event this afternoon is coming to an end. I'm Shifa. As the MC for today, would like to apologize if there were mistakes in bringing this event or if there's any word that less pleasing to our audience here. Once again, on behalf of sociology department, we would like to say a massive thank you to all speakers. Thank you for being here, making your time and delivering truly important issues. And most importantly, of course, thank you to all uh, the audience here for joining us. It has been our pleasure to host this event. And we're absolutely looking forward to have you again in the next event. So that's all for today. Thank you and have a pleasant day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam terima kasih Syifa. Ana terima kasih. Itu, Bu Ersa, terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Vidya, Bu Ersa. See you Ana. Ya, yeah, terima kasih ya. <laughs>